I was born into an Irish family. The name Murphy um, obviously is is um, right up there with, uh, you know, at least in Ireland, the last I checked, um, was the most popular surname in Ireland. So I didn't have a choice. <laughs> when I, um, my grandparents are from Ireland. My uh, grandfather, Daniel Murphy, was from uh, a little uh, town on the western end, Dingle, a, a beach city in County Kerry. And then my grandmother was from uh, Ackle Island in County Mayo. Um, funny thing is, they both came here within a year to the States. They didn't come together. They um, came across the Atlantic on the ships, and they met, we think, Cleveland or in Detroit, um, one of the two um, cities. They met here, two Irish uh, young kids, immigrants, uh, to America, came together, met. They had my uh, my aunt, uh, Mary, and they had my dad, John Murphy. That was Darren Murphy, baseball coach at South Hills High School in California. Hello, happy Independence Day to our American listeners, and welcome to episode 91 of the Irish Baseball Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Becker. Darren Murphy will be my guest on the show for the second time. His first visit to the podcast was on December 4th of 2023 in episode 76. Today, Murphy will start our conversation talking about a recent visit to Ireland where he tried to teach the game on the other side of the Atlantic. Growing the game in Ireland and with young athletes in the United States is very much the goal of the Irish American Baseball Society. To learn more about that mission, please visit irishbaseball.org. That's also where you can go to listen to every past episode of the Irish Baseball Podcast. Right now, let's welcome Darren Murphy to the show. Thanks for being here, Darren. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You recently had a trip to Ireland where you gave a free clinic to youth baseball coaches. So now you're going from teaching players and coaching players to trying to basically coach a new generation of coaches and build the game in another country where it's not quite as popular. So how do you go about doing that? And how do you almost not assume that they know as much about the game as people do here in the U S well, that, that opportunity was, um, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I, I wish we would have caught more of it on video and probably taken, taken more photos. I guess that's like every family vacation back in the old days. We all wish we would have captured more. Um, but it will be a great memory to me because if you saw it, it was nothing fancy. You know, it was at the uh, O'Malley, uh, Peter O'Malley fields that the Dodgers did back there, which was really cool because I had only seen that on YouTube. Um, but when you're there, it's, it's a nice field, but here in the U S especially in the last 20 years, um, in high school, especially you, you really kind of get judged as a coach, at least in California, partly how your field looks. Um, and if you go to a ragtag field in California, it generally says that the program either doesn't play much or that the coach doesn't put a lot of time in. And sometimes that's unfair, but that is what is going on, especially at least in California right now. Um, but when I got there, I didn't care that the field didn't look like Dodger Stadium. I just couldn't believe that I was actually doing baseball in Ireland. And I had these adults that were wanting to learn like young kids do at the camps that I do. And um I actually put the uh, the adults on the field and we start doing some throwing drills. We start doing some fielding. Um, I just start talking to them about defense and, hey, from what I'm gathering and what I'm seeing in these videos, we've got to shore up the defensive side of the game. Because if you guys can play defense and you guys can play catch, hey, if it's 0-0 in the sixth or seventh inning, you still got a shot. But if it's 10 or 11 to 1 or 10 to, a, 10 to 2 because you guys can't make a play, one, the kids aren't going to want to gravitate and, to coming back and keep playing. But the defensive side, in my opinion, is where the game is won at the high level. But also, it's where 
the interest in coming back happens um, because you're in a good ball game and it's competitive. The hitting always comes later, uh, even when we start a season. You know, the pitching and the defense is ahead of the hitting. And I took that approach when we did the the little clinic with the coaches. Um, we didn't have all day. We didn't have multiple days. So the first thing we kind of instituted was, hey, how can we get better defensively? And that taught, we talked about positioning. I talked to them about the importance of learning to go to your left because almost every play in the infield goes to your left. And they said that was the thing that hurt their teams the most was making routine plays or let's say every play there is tough right now. Let's try to make them more of a routine play. And the expectation is that we will make these plays. So we have a chance and there isn't so much pressure on the hitting to score every time because we're giving up runs so much on the defensive side. So most of the two hours or so I was there, we really did a lot of defense. And then we uh, went to the offensive side and we just talked about where to be very basics, where to be in the batter's box, what to look for, put the ball in play. Let's start with baby steps. And um, I've kept a, a text thread with the coaches and they said that they went on a little winning streak, uh, so forth. And they said that they really thought it helped. And um, I think it's more them probably because they're staying at it with the kids, but any way that I could have made something a little bit better um, I'm proud of and would love to, to go back and, you know, make it more than a day and maybe we get the kids next time out and um Maybe we can get a, a number of coaches, our players to go. Um, I think that would go a long way with the kids there, them seeing, you know, some Americans and some Irish Americans, maybe a couple of minor league to major league players uh, to spark an interest um, would really get it going. But it was fun. So when we talk about our big goal of eventually having Ireland in the World Baseball Classic, as you talk to some of the coaches over there, what do you think that would do to baseball in Ireland? Like that would almost have to be like a huge shot in the arm where all of a sudden these kids could not only, you know, watch major league games, which helps, I'm sure, but they can see people representing Ireland playing against the U.S. or the Dominican or Japan or these huge programs and saying, OK, maybe we're not at that level, but we can actually get on the field and compete against these teams that would have to really spark some of these kids. Well, you you and everybody that that is probably in this society and listening to these podcasts can relate. If you are Irish and anything good comes, the Irish jump on board. Um, Conor McGregor comes to mind to all the classic old boxers to an Irish movie. If uh, an Irish movie comes out, me and my family, we go see it. We want to be good. We love being Irish. And I really think for Ireland and for baseball in Ireland, what a shot in the arm it will be if they see themselves on TV, meaning they see Irish, fellow Irish Americans and whatnot, even, especially if we can get some major leaguers and they have Ireland across their chest. I would imagine the, the pubs, the restaurants and so forth would jump on board are we going to overtake Hurley and overtake Gaelic football right away? No, but that's not the goal. It's actually, can we just get in the same room? Can we get you guys to want to play or explore this sport? And I think it's really needed. And I think it's great that we're going on a two year, you know, March to get this done because exposure is everything. And what these kids and what the world all does have in common is the internet and cell phones and YouTube. And if we can get in that stadium and play and have Ireland across our chest, I think the Irish will jump on board. So why don't we talk a little bit about your Irish heritage? Cause you have mentioned it a few times since we've been talking, how much has it been a part of you growing up? Like we have 
I want to say two different types of people in this organization. A lot of people find out a little later and then as adults, they sort of do all that research. And then we have the people who it was just since day one, it was part of their identity. So where do you fall on that? And why don't you just talk about that heritage a little bit? I was born into an Irish family. The name Murphy um, obviously is is um, right up there with, uh, you know, at least in Ireland, the last I checked, um, was the most popular surname in Ireland. So I didn't have a choice. <laughs> when I, um, my grandparents are from Ireland. My uh, grandfather, Daniel Murphy, was from uh, a little uh, town on the western end, Dingle, a, a beach city in County Kerry. And then my grandmother was from uh, Ackle Island in County Mayo. Um, funny thing is, they both came here within a year to the States. They didn't come together. They um, came across the Atlantic on the ships, and they met, we think, Cleveland or in Detroit, um, one of the two um, cities. They met here, two Irish uh, young kids, immigrants, uh, to America, came together, met. They had my uh, my aunt, uh, Mary, and they had my dad, John Murphy. Um, so my aunt and my father uh, were two first-generation Americans with, with Irish parents. They filtered it down. Um, we had the Clancy brothers playing in the house, um, Tommy Makeham, uh, all the old classics, um, artists. St. Patrick's Day is like Christmas at our house. You know, here now as a coach, um, you know, we have Irish Day here on the 17th. We play. Very fortunately, my my school colors here are green and gold, so it works out well. But we play Irish music the whole day. We have the Irish flag up on the flagpole. But going back to being a kid, it's such a big thing, and it's extended to – I have cousins all through. We, You know, we just went to a Detroit Tigers-Angels game, and we had about 30 cousins all at the game. And um, I've gotten, uh, I think, half of them to join the society now in the last week. Um, but we, you know, I have one cousin in particular who throws this huge St. Patrick's Day party every year with a band with, uh, we invite the neighborhood and, you know, it's well over 100 people at this party. And it's just embedded in us from the pride to uh, what it means. We've you know, filtered filtered it down to my wife, to my three kids. We've been to Ireland now two times in the last two years. My kids are starting to get on board. At first, they thought it was being forced a little bit, but I think they're secretly trying. They're secretly now uh, having that pride and uh, doing their research themselves and what it means. And um, we just love it. It's it's just something that we've been born with, and um, it's not going to leave us. So we talk about how Ireland has played a big part and your Irish heritage has played a big part in your past and growing up and being the person you are now. Obviously, baseball has played a similar role. And when did you really find that spark? Who were some of the players who lit the fire under you to want to make this your career and... How did that come about as being another part of your personality? We were playing wiffle ball every day in the backyard. Um, I, like I said, I had two older brothers, and we had, we we painted our fence. We painted foul poles on the fence. Um, we did the dimensions on the fence. I I still remember one of the one of the corners of the field was only like sixty three feet, and we had it painted on the fence. But we had all these different rules. You know, we actually, you couldn't hit home runs because um, we lost the ball. So, you know, if you hit a home run, you were out. So we really worked on hitting line drives and hitting the ball the other way. And it, we were doing it to save the baseballs because we didn't want them to go over the fence. But it, it kind of really ingrained us in how to play the game the right way, the hard way. And I still think about my poor mom probably refereeing all the fights and the arguments we had in the backyard but I will say unanimously, and it's probably a controversial uh, figure in some households, but we all loved Pete Rose. That was our guy. 
And we all, that was our favorite player amongst our three brothers. Uh, my favorite older player is Mickey Mantle. He's before my time, but that was my dad's favorite player. And my dad would talk about when the Yankees came to town in Detroit and the Mick playing right in front of them. And I have never worn another uniform besides number seven, um, even through my coaching career. And it's all been tied back to Mickey Mantle, who I've only seen play on, on, you know, in videos and on TV and in movies. But um, I would say if you, the two favorites are probably Mickey Mantle and Pete Rose and um, kind of a funny story. My daughter's name is Rose, my youngest. And um, we were having a meet Rose party when she was born. And I told my dad about the meet Rose party. And my dad thought I said Pete Rose party. Mm-hmm. And um, that's kind of how, <laughs> how backwards we are a little bit on our baseball. But I had to correct him and say, dad, it's a meet Rose party, not Pete Rose. Um, but it would be fun to think what would a Pete, party, Pete Rose party be consisted of. Um, if you think well, about it, I, well, I guess it depends on if yeah. Pete's throwing it himself. I think there could be a lot of things going on at that party. <laughs> yeah, that might be a that might be another podcast. <laughs> so you've taken that love of baseball from when you were a kid, and now it is your career. And with everything that goes on, you've mentioned travel ball already, and you've mentioned the internet and trying to get college scholarships for kids and stuff like that. How do you try to keep that just love of the game when there are so many other things that people focus on surrounding the game that sometimes I think players burn out on their actual love for it because it becomes a job. It becomes a chore. How do you keep, them thinking of this game as something to love and to want to keep in your life for your entire life and not get them burnt out on it. Okay. We, you know, it's funny as we just had a conversation yesterday, uh, a planned discussion yesterday that I thought was just going to take a couple minutes. I had to read, uh, you know, some reminders to them about some games this weekend and so forth. And it turned into what you asked about, about uh, how do we keep them, engaged and how do we keep them in baseball and i i turned it on him and i said hey, guys i know it's starting to get a little long i need your attention but this is what you're going to be doing some of you are going to possibly be doing this in a few years because the next generation of coaches needs to come we're all not going to be here forever and who in this dugout is going to take up the torch and help the next generation and if you're having a tough time right now listening and being focused, what are you going to do when you go to the next level and the college coaches talk for an hour every day? But more importantly, we need you to pay attention and listen because you are going to share this information with little brothers that you have, cousins, or your son's team, hopefully not in the next couple of years, maybe in the next 10 years, 15 years, that you are now standing in front of your son's team or your daughter's team. And you guys are now in charge of spreading the greatness of this game. And so we want you to also learn the game so you can teach it because we all got that responsibility to keep this game going. Because if you've gotten to this point, you're playing in high school, I'm going to guess that the game has been good to you. The game has been fantastic to me and all of us old coaches, but If you keep coming back and you keep trying to play this game, which in my opinion is the hardest game for a variety of reasons, you've got to really learn the game so you're in the position to keep it going and paying it forward. Because this game gives so much back to us that we owe it to keep it going. And the game is changing. And we've got to stay up with those, you know, with the metrics to the communication, to all those things. But How do we keep it going and how do we keep it interesting and also really get back to the first reason we all got into this and it was for it to be fun. So every day is a battle and every day is a challenge and so forth, but you've really got to remember we're trying to make this fun and if it's not fun, then then why are we doing it? Absolutely. Darren Murphy, thank you so much for everything that you are trying to do here for Irish baseball and of course, 
Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Irish Baseball Podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. And go Irish. That was Darren Murphy, baseball coach at South Hills High School in California. I'm Rick Becker, and this has been episode 91 of the Irish Baseball Podcast.